Good evening, everybody. Welcome to French of Blessing Church's Wednesday evening Bible study. Today is Wednesday, January 31st. Tomorrow we're into February already. So, hey, missed you last week. I think we had a week off last week, but you are probably aware that we are in a Bible study on the book of Revelation, the letter Revelation our Wednesday night adult Bible study at Friendship Wesleyan Church. I think this puts us into week three of our 16-week Bible studies. I think 19 total because of a couple nights off. February 14th coming up, Ash Wednesday. We have an Ash Wednesday service, so we won't be having online or in-house Bible study. If you're in the area, then we will be having Ash Wednesday. would love to have you uh, see you here. We may put that one online. Not sure about that right now. But um, I want to remind you, our plan is a four-week kind of a broad overview, kind of generalizing. I hate to do that with end times material, prophetic literature, apocalyptic literature. But um, I thought it was a good idea. Then in that fifth week, we'll begin a more intensive chapter by chapter, not necessarily verse by verse study of Revelation. So keep that in mind. I'll make you aware of that next week. This week, we're going to be talking about Israel. Next week, the U.S. nutshell, where does all of that fit into the end times? Our text for today from our homework last week, Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 17. But I'm going to tell you, this Bible study, we're not even going to get to this. The reading plan was for you to have a, you know, a schedule to follow along with. Didn't mean we were necessarily going to get to it uh, exactly that way. And we're going to be in that fifth week coming back and picking up our study anyway. And uh, it was part of your homework last week. We're going to tackle some of chapter one this week. So between that and uh, Israel, bring us up to date as to where we are with Israel in history and end times thing. It took the bulk of our time together. So we need to get started. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to take right off. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for everybody viewing, watching, all of us together, challenging one another through this unique form. Thank you for it, of online Bible study. So bless us tonight, each and every home, with the interpretation of your word, with your spirit speaking to us, sharp, double-edged sword, Cut where you need to in our lives, Lord, tonight. Speak to us. Grow us that we would be more like Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So I thought I'd start with the uh, screen with your homework from last week. Seven churches in Revelation. Just figure that out a little bit. We're going to do that. Modern history of Israel from 1948. I'm actually going to back up into biblical history and bring us up to 19, the 1940s, uh, 1960s. We're going to talk about it some, so much there. There's just no way tonight to get to all that. Symbolism in chapter one actually ended up, that's where our starting point is going to be. Um, I Last week, you'd have to go back to, oh, the week before last, we, did, we missed last week. But you'd actually have to go back to that video. It's cool because you can go to YouTube and watch it. To if you missed that, then you won't. You didn't get our uh, study on symbolism, Revelation. The Bible's got lots of symbolism in it. So I gave you that little bit of homework to tackle some of the symbolism in chapter one. We're only going to get to a few details of what's in chapter one. Uh, it, once again, even when we back up at the fifth week and study chapter by chapter, we won't get to every detail. Um, symbolism, especially in Revelation, all through it. Um, and, uh, and so take a, it would take an extensive amount of time to study every detail of the symbolism in Revelation. But I thought we'd whet our appetite for it some uh, this evening. Um, the, uh, last week, I gave you a little hint. I said 
that sometimes the Bible explains the symbolism right there within the text. I'll add to that. We'll find this out tonight as well. And the Bible from uh, the entirety of the Bible will often um, have uh, the explanation for symbolism in other places in the biblical text. If it's not right there, uh, then uh, oftentimes you can find it in other places in the Bible. We'll do that this evening. So let's tackle some of this symbolism in chapter one of Revelation. I think I've got my Bible marked here. Revelation chapter one, go to verse 12. Let me read through verse 17. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. Matter of fact, you know, I think I'll do it here now. I was going to do it after I got done reading. But I found an image. Images for this text are not easy to find. The ones you find aren't very good. Um, it's hard to find them with the sword coming out of the mouth. But hey, as I read this, try to, and this looks like a, a some sort of a artistic, rendering from quite a while back. Um, some of the best pictures are from uh, antiquity, if you will. And uh, so uh, watch for some of the images as I read. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a rope, re robe reaching down to his feet with a gold sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. So we've got all of this symbolism um, in that small portion of text that uh, I just read for you. We, I, we probably read the text last week. But like I said, very few. if you go look for images on this text <clears throat> to get some idea of what might have looked like, very few have a sword um, out of the mouth of the one that looked like the Son of Man. <clears throat> but Let's tackle the symbolism here a little bit with the sword. And matter of fact, I wanted to do that because someone actually asked me last week about the symbolism with the sword. And this symbolism is one of those things that we can actually connect in other places in the Bible. And so... Let me, uh, you know what? I put the text right up here for you. So so we've got this text that says that um, there was, there is a sword uh, coming out of his mouth. Verse 16 was a sharp double-edged sword. This one's not that difficult to tackle. So in Hebrews chapter Four verse 12, <clears throat> for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any, excuse me, don't, let me get a drink of water here. That'll help. <clears throat> sharper than any double-edged sword, if you've ever heard that quoted, this is where it comes from. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart so he had so the sword is the word of god for the word of god is alive sharper than a double-edged sword so the sword represents uh, god's word then then in john chapter one in the beginning was the word and the word was god and the word was god the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 14. All that to say this, clearly 
the sword represents a couple of things. Well, it represents God's word, right? It it represents one of the things it's reinfor it's reinforcing in this vision that the apostle John is having that this is Jesus because Jesus is the word according to the gospel of John, right? Chapter one. So he is the word. And this sword also represents that <clears throat> uh, Jesus has the authority of divine judgment. And so, um, so the, the, this symbol, pretty, pretty simple to unpack from other places uh, in God's word, Hebrews 4.12, and then in John chapter 1, 1 through 14. So then, um, you know, I thought one of the things throwing me off is, I, there we go. I, I thought I had uh, uh, circled the sword, but I also learned in my PowerPoint how to get those circles to go away. So I must have timed it wrong. But uh, then there's uh, the last week when I gave you the clue, uh, I want to zero in on that now, if you will, because the text says, right, that, um, matter of fact, if you go to verse 20, you'll see why I said last week, it's right in the text sometimes. Because verse 20 says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. Notice that the Lord is speaking in the first person. So this is this is Jesus speaking to John, right? And if you have a red letter Bible like mine, you're seeing the red letters. Is this, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands. It's kind of touchy to, uh, to get it to go away. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. So remember the week before last, the last study, we made note that Revelation was written to and for the seven churches, and they are addressed in this book of the Bible, in this letter. So the seven stars are what? The seven angels. Um, if you have a study Bible, there's a note by that. And I want to just point something out about that. But, um, and I think anywhere it mentions the word angel, you're going to see that note. So we got an easy interpretation as far as uh, it tells us right here that the seven stars are the seven angels. Uh, of the seven churches. Now we could dig deeper on that. I did. I did a little word study here. So if um, if you compare translations, which I did, I compared 32 different translations on the seven stars being the angels. And I went to that word angels. I found six translations. Um, one, one more literal one. I was surprised <laughs> that translates this word angel into messenger. And the reason why, and your note in your study Bible, if you have it at the word angels in that verse 20, will say, uh, it'll, it'll say, or messengers. The footnote will take you to a note that says, or messenger, because that word in Greek literally meant a messenger, a supernatural messenger from God. But if you look at the Greek word, it's obviously the word angel, uh, angel, uh, angelos, uh, however you would say that in the, the Greek, obviously connected then in Latin to English and to our word angel. So the most literal translation would be uh, angel. Like I said, the six out of 32 translations use the word messenger, not the NIV, ESV, KJV that most of you have. They all use the word uh, angel. And, uh, and, and really, in all of that, you, you, you're probably thinking, why comment on that? There's a little debate as if you did if you did your deeper digging there's a little debate as to whether these angels see now we're getting into further interpretation of the symbolism 
it clearly says the stars are the angels. What are the angels? And uh, debate as to whether they're heavenly messengers that were bringing this message to the churches or bringing message to the church. Each of the churches had their own angel messenger or whether these were earthly messengers, people that, um, and we could dig on that even more, that angels show up in the form of people, things like that. But most scholars agree that we're talking about heavenly uh, beings here, messengers, not the earthly messengers. That's why I was surprised that more literal translation, one of them used the word messenger. Um, so I, I've got a comment on this. It's one of those things. Remember, we're doing observation, interpretation, application. It is in God's character to send angels as messengers. Um, as a matter of fact, there's some support in the, I struggled with this for a long time, but there's some support in the scripture that we have guardian angels. Did you know that? So I thought I would just point this out in scripture for you quickly. In Hebrews chapter one, verse 14, the author writes, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. So maybe there is something to each of us having a guardian angel. And uh, and then the, the connection to the scripture we're doing right now is, is if it, it makes sense that God would send heavenly messengers uh, to, uh, to his churches. So each of the churches has a messenger. What do we do about the churches? First of all, they're real places, okay? So these are real churches. You may rep recognize some of the names of the churches like Ephesus. We've got a letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. So these are literal churches with a message to, so the messengers were taking a message um, to the churches um, for uh, at that time, but most agree, and I agree, that they were also messages for the church for today. Um, so messages at the time and messages for the church. This little location map I'm giving you, in-house, I printed it off for people. You can actually see a two-word description. So if you go to the text in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you will see the actual messages to the church, to the churches, the seven churches. And these two-word phrases represent what those messages were to each of those churches. And I like this map, it's a bit colorful, but you can then see in relationship to Israel, Jerusalem, where these seven churches were located in Asia. So I also create a little list for you. I said they were messages for the churches then and for us today, application, right? So let's just quickly, Ephesus, Chapter 2, 1 through 7, the church that had forsaken its first love, Smyrna. 2, 8 through 11, the church that would suffer persecution, Pergamum. 2, 12 through 17, the church that needed to repent, Thyatira. Uh, 18 through 29, the church that had a false prophetess, Sardis. Chapter 3, 1 through 6, the church that had fallen asleep. Philadelphia, chapter 3, 7 through 13, the church that had endured patiently. Laodicea, chapter 3, 14 through 23, 22, the church with the lukewarm faith. We'll come back further study on these when we get to that. Because this, remember, I'm just doing broad strokes. But this week, I wanted us to tackle a little bit, and it was in your homework. How does Israel fit in end times prophecy? Wow. So let's let's begin a little journey on that. We've tackled symbolism a little bit, the seven churches in Revelation. Boy, I was tempted to go all the way back to Genesis and try to unpack because it's all it's all connected. As a matter of fact, simple Bible history is really human history, really helps to understand the events that we're seeing in Israel, the Middle East, and the world today. So, matter of fact, what you're watching today is real biblical history, Bible prophecy that is taking place 
in real time. But I did just want to give you some reminders, a broad stroke as to that early history of the Holy Land, the land of Israel. Uh, Abraham, God had instructed him to leave his land, right? I'll show you a map in a moment. In chapter 12, 6 through 7, this kind of begins our journey in the history. Just a real broad stroke. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At, the, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram. By the way, remember when Abram got there, or if you didn't know this, he had a good relationship with the few peoples that were in that land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there, the Lord appeared to them, to him. So this is the text where Israel becomes the inheritors, the um, even, even in the modern day battle, this is the beginning of Israel's um, right to belief in their ownership of the land in that, uh, in the Holy Land. So let me take you to a map. Um, and mainly showing you this because of the text that we just read, okay? As far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem, the Lord appeared to Abraham in that place. So here we are. He leaves Ur, uh, Ur of the Chaldeans, many agree with, travels to Shechem. There's two different lines here because this map is um, two different views as to how he uh, Abram traveled, but I simply want to show you so you can see the Middle East here, at least the outline, the form of it, and Abram in Shechem, where God promises to give him that land, that that territory. So um, I got lots of other <laughs> diagrams here, but so um, you know, I already mentioned that what you're watching today is biblical history prophecy in real time. So just going to Genesis chapter 12, and then we're going to skip a bunch of biblical history. And I want to take you to the d divided kingdom of Israel. Hopefully, I, I, you know, I get confused so easy. My attempts here are to get rid of all the confusion but I think sometimes I'm creating confusion while I'm trying to get rid of it. So take yourself back to Genesis chapter 12. I didn't give you a circle around this, but hopefully you can see the cursor there. History of Israel begins in Genesis 12 with Abraham, Abraham at the time, God's promise that he would inherit the, the Holy Land, the promised land. And so then Israel, we unpack all of that history. We're skipping a lot of things because of sin, because of wickedness and brokenness. Israel ends up a divided nation in that land, the northern country of Israel, the southern uh, land of Judah. And what I wanted to highlight, they're going to be overrun by their enemies, right? The Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians big pieces of history. This one that we're coming up to right now, the Babylonians are the enemy. Um, if you read the biblical text in these stories, they've got the, the books of the Bible where you can read the biblical stories. You will find out the different things that happen with the bad leaders of Israel. And then the eventual, uh, and I highlighted this, circled this for you, uh, Israel is taken captive by the Assyrians in 722 BC. So imagine this. So the enemy comes in and they take them captive, right, back to their nation. They disperse them. Um, and we'll talk about the diaspora in a moment. The, then uh, Jude, Judah makes it past that, the southern divided nation, the southern portion of that. Um, makes it past 722 BC, but in 586 BC, Jerusalem is taken and the temple destroyed by the Babylonians. And we have the basically the end of Israel's time in the promised land. And what I wanted to point out to you, the reason I like this little diagram is so it has the 400 silent years, there were no prophetic messages, and we enter into the New Testament. 
And so beginning in 606, when the Babylonians invade, the destruction of Jerusalem, 586, when they take. So now we've got the whole nation of Israel, the promised land. They'd come in after the, the exodus to the promised land and, uh, and grew there. But then because of sin, the nation was divided. Now they're, they've been taken captive by their enemies another way to oh i highlighted the 400 silent years for you forgot that another way to um to understand this piece of history is through the temples of the beginning with the tabernacle so i will i'm going to try to so we've got this timeline here and then i'm going to piece it together with the temples because this will bring us into um, the kind of modern day understanding of what's going on in Israel. So 506, uh, 586, the temple's destroyed. So we go back here, Where the temple, what's the history of that? So remember this all began um, with the tabernacle uh, back in the book of Exodus. Moses was given the instructions for the building of the tabernacle. They build the tabernacle. That was the mobile temple. Then eventually Solomon, David's son, builds the temple. It's known as Solomon's temple in 968 BC. Um, the temple is, to, remember back in that other timeline, we said that the temple was destroyed here. So that brings us to this place right here. Solomon's temple is destroyed. The uh, Judah and the rest of Israel is taken into the Babylonian exile. Well, a remnant's allowed to go back. You can read those stories in Ezra and Nehemiah. So now we're moving along. Um, the, the temple's rebuilt. It's known as Zerubbabel's reconstruction. Some consider it another temple, most just a reconstruction of Solomon's temple. And then um, uh, Zerubbabel's temple is uh, dismantled, replaced by Herod's temple in 19 BC. And that none of that is what I'm really trying to get to. What I'm really trying to get to is then the final temple, Zerubbabel's temple, connected to Solomon's temple, is destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Excuse me. And biblical history, the way we know it, in a lot of ways, it's done. Jesus has been born in the New Testament uh, years, and the and the the church age and the age of mercy and grace is birth. <clears throat> and there is no temple in Jerusalem to this day, from that A.D. 70 destruction of the temple. So let's consider these things also. It's a miracle following that history that the Jews even exist today. Remember, they're taken captive in 606. The temple's destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians. So we go all the way back to those years BC. And there were very few Jews left in Israel, a remnant they're referred to. Matter of fact, I forgot to put the year in here, but in AD 135, and this is kind of, now we're getting into modern history following the destruction of the temple. Rome issued a decree that any new Jew found in Palestine would be killed immediately. Um, not to mention history we're familiar with where people have tried to um, exterminate the Jews, the the World War II, um, you know the, uh, uh, the 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 whole history we're familiar with uh, there with uh, Hitler and the Nazis and what the Jews went through during the Holocaust, and so you put all that together, it's incredible that the Jews even exist. Almost all nations from antiquity in recorded history have lost their identity in three to 500 years. The Hittites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, matter of fact, the Hittites wouldn't even uh, have been known if it wasn't for the Bible. 
real interesting archaeological. They were only in the Bible, and a lot of people believe that the Bible had a group of people that never even existed, but modern archaeology has now proved the existence of the Hittites. And so um, uh, the so uh, hopefully in some ways this makes biblical history and begins to bring you up to today. So why does Israel continue to exist? If these, you know, thinking about these things and what the Jews have been through in history with that being taken out of their homeland and all of that, why does Israel continue to exist? And this is where we get into prophetic literature, apocalyptic literature, Ezekiel chapter 37, widely agreed upon as to the, one of the, uh, one of the places where the promises to return them to their homeland exist. Then he said to me, son of man, and this is the Valley of Dry Bones. You can go back and read it all and study the whole thing. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. So just a, a text from Ezekiel to show you the extensive amount of like prophetic literature and what, what many scholars think about them. We could spend a lot of time on and debate and things like that. The point is, is that God's word, the Bible that we have in hand, is the reason why Israel continues to exist today and the promises that God made with um, Abram. And now we, we could connect it today, we're not going to, but the new covenant and the promise that we have for the inheritance through, through Christ. So the return of the Jews, so, so imagine this now, the Jews have been gone for thousands of years, only a remnant in Israel. And in the 20th century, this began to significantly change. The return of Jews to Israel is a major end times event, most agree. And it's such kind of a big thing, no matter what you think about the end times, this is a big event. So you can see 1917, 25,000 Jews in Israel. Uh, following World War II, there was a uh, um, significant um, increase, uh, and we'll get to that in just a moment, the history of that. But uh, so in 45, we had 500,000. Then by 2006, 5 million. And I did my research as of December 31st, there's 7,208,000 Jews in Israel. Um, uh, Israel population is much larger than that, more than 9 million people. Um, the rest would be uh, Arab, Muslim, and of course, other, other nations. But uh, the return of the Jews to Israel is big stuff and a big part of end times events. Jeremiah 23, 3, another text of prophetic literature, I myself will gather the remnant, there's that word of my flock, out of all the countries where I've driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. And when you find out about the Jews from all over the world in the 20th century and up to today that have been returning to Israel, it'll blow your mind. It makes this text um, in a lot of very real ways come alive. One of the more significant events in modern history you might be familiar of is the return of the Jews to, uh, not the return of the Jews to Israel. This um, brought a lot of it on, but in 1948, May 14th to be exact, um, the uh, head of the Jewish agency in Israel proclaimed the establishment of uh, the state of Israel and the U.S. president at the time, Harry S. Truman, recognized Israel 
as a new nation on that same day. So this is May 16th, the copy of this newspaper, Palestine Post, the state of Israel is born. See, now you can understand this statement in light of biblical history, right? The hope of 2,000 years is fulfilled because they, most of them have been gone since um, 586, 606 BC, and then with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the Romans, um, it really created what's known as a dispersion from Israel. Now, now we've been talking about Israel, but here's some things on Jerusalem. Uh, when when Israel gained the, the nation status, they didn't gain all of the land and and uh, and didn't have authority over the city of Jerusalem. So just a few statistics about Jerusalem, 937,000. It's not much of a city is the point. 937,000 people versus Tokyo, 37.4 million. I think the largest city in the world. Um, New York, I think, has 20 million people. This is somewhere around the size of Detroit. I, for, I forgot, I think Detroit has 600,000 if you're a Michigander. Jerusalem has been built and rebuilt more than any other city, no significant river, no harbor. Um, all that to put it in the light of another biblical text from Zechariah, on that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. Um, so when you look at Israel and Jerusalem and you're wondering how this little bitty place in all of history and how other cultures and peoples are long gone. Here we have this little place and these people seemingly clearly preserved. And at this moment in history, um, larger in population and everything than they have ever been, it brings into light this whole thing. So, so back to Jerusalem, um, so we have 1948, Israel becomes a nation. Then in 1967, I wish I could unpack this whole thing for you. I won't. I don't remember the event. I was alive, but it's called the Six Day War, 1967. And in that Six Day War, Israel, it's amazing, the land that Israel acquired in that Six Day War and then gave back in peace. But one of the things that happened was Israel regained control of Jerusalem in 1967 for the first time since uh, 606 BC when the Babylonians had overrun Judah and taken uh, control of Jerusalem. So we're talking modern history, 1967, the first time. An interesting piece of history that day that Israel took over uh Jerusalem, um, because in the seventh century, you probably know this, a Muslim mosque was built on um, on the Temple Mount, seventh century, known as the Dome of the Rock. Probably seen pictures of it. I don't have them for you today. I could offer it for you, but you've probably seen it. So when they regained control of Jerusalem, here's this Muslim mosque on the Temple Mount, and. Uh, the commander of the defense forces of Israel um, immediately put an Israeli flag over the Dome of the Rock. But Moshe Dayan, some of you that are my age will remember that name, um, who was in charge of Israel, removed the flag in the name of, of peace at the time. And Israel even gave the Sinai Peninsula and other things back to Egypt at the time in that war or peace. So the now that doesn't bring us up to the exact events that are taking place right now in Israel, but hopefully that picture makes you keenly aware of human history the way it's in the Bible, which is real history, and that um, there's not a lot there to have to understand to really see that when it comes to the Middle East and to Israel and their place in the world today, 
and the promises in God's word to care for them, protect them, and to um, uh, bring them back to their homeland, homeland and all. These events that are taking place now really make us sit up and watch, right? As a matter of fact, I want to close with this. What does all this mean? The same thing it always has. <laughs> and all of these things we discuss, no matter what you think about them, I think this point is true for all of us. And that is what all this should make us keenly aware of is our need to be ready. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect. We want to unpack be ready. We did that before. We'll do it again. Most importantly, if you're watching tonight and you don't have, uh, if Jesus is not the Savior of your life, you're not in a personal relationship with him, that's the number one place where all this begins. For you to pray, pray a prayer of forgiveness, a prayer of confession of the sinfulness of your life, and confession that your hunger and desire to make Jesus uh, Lord of your life. Um, let me, well, let me show you the homework for next week. And then the reading plan has Revelation 2, 18 through 3, 22. We will probably get to that text some, or at least into chapter two. Where do you think America fits in the end times prophecy events? Hey, and here's one, I don't know. Um, I'm going to unpack this for you next week. What do Wesleyans believe about the end times? So to be a member of the Wesleyan Church, what do you have to think? What do you have to believe? Um, if you could find that anywhere, dig on it. Otherwise, I'll unpack that for you next week. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Oh, Father, thank you for the be ready words of Jesus and the knowledge we have as we walk through your word of how in control you are. Father, in our living down here in the day-to-day, -day, it would be easy to go, this whole thing's out of control, and ask the questions about, do you know, do you understand, do you care? Father, we look at this, your word, and we unpack the history and the events, and we go, you are in control. You've been in control since the beginning of time. You love us. You're being merciful and patient. So, Father, I would that everybody viewing tonight would know Jesus and salvation and your hope, Father that uh, if, if the return of Jesus was today, the judgment was soon, that we would all be ready. May it be so, your peace on each and every home, Father. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless. Have a God week.